All right, all done. So the next talk we have up is Michelle, who's going to be talking to us about the newest vehicle type addition in the IG Pilot world, which is support for blimps. So uh, over to you, Michelle. Um, yep, so just um, screen share. So can everyone um, see the slides? Yep, all good. Cool. Um, hi everyone, um, thank you for um, inviting me to do a talk here. Um, so of course, I, I'm Michelle and I'm um, presenting on limb support um, for Archipilot. And so this is um, some of our prototypes so far. Um, so yeah, it's just a quick about me. Um, I'm doing a master's degree um, at UNSW with um, 3 dollars in math. And so there's some, um, yeah, info as well. Um, so this is um, what I'm gonna be covering today. Um, and so, so we're just gonna kind of go through reasoning why and then hardware and software and things. So they're also um, known as airships, of course, you know, just helium balloons with some form of propulsion, um, usually props, not in this case. Um, so because they have, they don't need any power to keep them in the air. So you can get long flight times depending on how you've got everything else set up. Um, so they're, um, they're useful for the um, indoor application as well because um, they don't get damaged um, or you know, crashes easily as most other um, drones would. So even with the fins, like I've run it into walls and it just bounces off. Um, so you have the relatively low airflow um, that's caused by the um, blimp itself, where with any like multi-rotor, if you fly it over the disc, you're gonna have papers going everywhere. Um, so um, using the fins instead of the propellers um, also helps with that. So um, yeah, so it has a larger amount of air that's moving slowly and instead of having um, yeah, a small area where it could blow things around. So um, there, there has been previous interest in adding um, limb support to Archipilot, but um, up until now, it seems no one's um, gotten to it. As, so we kind of thought, well, we'll have it. We will give it a go. So as far as um, applications, um, you could be um, searching for a gas leak in a building, and then you would um, hopefully be able to um, track the gas leak because you would likely not be um, blowing it away quite as quickly. Um, any questions? So what sort of mass are these, are these blimps, the one you're working with? So at the moment, we get about um, 50 grams of lift. So um, yeah, the, the weight is quite the limiting factor. So yeah, all of the parts kind of, we choose them with, with that pretty much um, first priority. Yeah, that is, that is very, very low mass. Yeah. Difficult. We were just having discussion in the chat there about you know combining the visual odometry with a blimp, and I think the mm -hmm. the weight putting the the Raspberry Pi four and that camera on a blimp, it's not going to get off the ground very well, at least yeah. on the blimps that you're doing. Yeah, the the Pi zero maybe, but um, whether it's possible to do good VO on that low processing power, yeah, it remains to be seen, I guess. So now um, onto like the um, initial hardware tests. Um, so most of the project so far has been um, hardware troubles and um, just because of that low weight limit really. Um, and so we we started with a um, TNC 3.2, just um, writing Arduino code pretty much. Um, so um, we had, the test between the fins on the gondola versus directly attached to the balloon. And this photo shows one of the initial um, like 
yeah, one of our very first prototypes, which was using fins that um, had had been previously, um, yeah, designed for this. Or oh, yeah, that's someone that previously tried using. Um, so we've been testing different types of fins, trying to find good ways to get thrust go. So our servos um, are close to, but not quite 180 degrees. I think it's around 150 degrees. And so that's also difficult because when you're flapping them, you don't quite, you know, you can't point them straight down. So you lose that range of motion. Um, balloons have also been fun because um, latex ones just explode very easily. And so you, you can't reinflate them, which means you end up going through a lot of helium. Um, and they also deflate so quickly that we couldn't keep neutral buoyancy within like a five minute flight. So that was yeah, quite a big problem. And so the bigger foil balloons we had trouble getting a hold of. This is some of our setups we've had um, so far. So um, yeah, from um, top to bottom, left to right is kind of the um, chronological order. And so um, that's the first latex balloon. And then um, we had a foil balloon, but we had to attach another balloon on top of it because this size wasn't big enough. So we ended up finding a bigger size, etc. cetera. Um, these are the newer fins we're using um, to, um, yeah, which, um, can be a, a lot more um, effective. So then finally on to um, the, getting it into the um, blimp, which um, has been quite a um, learning curve and everything. Um, so we've implemented it as a separate vehicle um, because of the pretty different um, flight dynamics and things like that. Um, it's still very um, preliminary, um, at the moment, so because um, I've only been going for about three months on the blimp, uh, on the autopilot, so uh, in terms of getting blimp in it. Um, so the initial um, PR was merged because over a week ago. Um, thank you. Um, and yeah, so thank you to everyone who's helped with um, getting it this far. Um, so essentially, just um, had copied it as a um, template and then um, get the code that would be common as to most vehicles to kind of keep the structure similar um, to the other vehicles, hopefully. Uh, I should probably um, pause for questions again. Yeah, there's some questions in the chat. Uh, there was a, a poll. Do you want to um, uh, explain your question about the flexible oh, fins? Yes, I was just. Um, when I saw the original picture for the balsa ones, the solid balsa ones, I was asking, would they be more efficient if they allowed to flex towards the trailing edge like scuba flippers? And then I saw your next model with the flexible membrane, um, and it looks like there would be some trailing edge flex there. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I, I looked at both of balsa wood and the other ones and thought that's not going to um, end well. And so this was initially just done as a trial in one of our fin thrust tests. And so I guess, um, so this one does flex towards the end. And um, so that, that we ended up getting something like 50% extra thrust out of these, um, like same size fin on the same servos. So that helped a lot, yeah. How fast these fins, I mean, what sort of frequency are you are you operating it at to, for the flapping? So, um, at the moment, so with the thrust case, we found about three hertz was the um, best frequency for these fins. Um, but that'll depend on the servos and the fins you're using. So if you're using bigger fins, then, um, uh, you know, slower frequency is where you get the most thrust. Um, so that's a, a parameter in the implementation at the moment. So, yeah. So um, so in the um, so there's a fins class now that's um, used for actuating the fins, and so each um, servo has the values for its um, for its amplitude and offset depending on what the um, income it gets. So um, roll pitch, yaw, and height in this case. Um, so yeah, this is for 
each fin, you, um, yeah, when you're going down, you would need to be flapping both of them upwards so you can push yourself um, down. So the front and the back ones would flap upwards. Um, horizontal, of course, is just flapping whichever one's on the opposite side. And so for your, you again would offset it, uh, offset them both, you know, to the clockwise direction and flap them so you can go the other way. And so that's what this bit of code does. So um, that's the values for um, amplitude and that's for um, offset. And so it's, um, so it sets how much of each um, stick's input should go to the um, each fin's amplitude and offset. Sorry, it's uh, Randy. The, um, so I guess the way that the control works is the, the left and the right fins, they give you like rotation. Is that the idea? And yep. the forward and back give you like altitude control, I guess? Yep. Okay, cool. And so, yeah, so kind of um, putting those fins on double duty, I guess. Cool. And you don't you don't have to worry about rolling pitch control, is that right? Because it um yeah, it's uh yeah, because of the just weight at the mm -hmm. bottom, it yeah, centers itself. Cool. Um so yeah, the input multiplied by a fin matrix. Um so you end up with a amplitude and offset for each fin. We've also added a turbo mode for um Heighten your control so when when it gets to the um, maximum end of what you're pushing, it doubles the frequency, um, which is just yeah to try to add some extra speed because it does move quite slowly, um, but it's optional as well um, for depending on um, you know what yeah we are what you're using it for I guess. So. Um, all of the, the values of amplitude and offset for um, each um, servo is just um, put straight into a cost function and then um, output. So these um, amplitude and um, omega are in, uh, so the amplitude is zero to one and offset is negative one um, to one, but it's just um, multiplied by um, the RC scale um, being used. And so we've just added manual and LAN modes. So manual is um, directly to this um, fin mixing code and LAN just um, stops the fins, which is really just for um, a fail safe. And so I was just gonna um, show why the frequency kind of um, needs to stay the same. Um, this is what happens when the fins are not um, exactly in sync. So you end up with it just wobbling and not really moving far because the two of um, adding to each other. But if they're moving in sync, then they um, mostly cancel each other out. So you get less um, wobble on the height in your control. Um, so um, for Next up, we've, um, we've also been asked by the um, Navy uh, Research Lab in the US to build and send a couple of blimps over them to be flown during um, the Defend the Republic um, blimp flight competition. And, and so that's been sent over and the um, yeah, competition's happening um, this week. So we're also um, working on adding um, the autonomous function. So initially just um, the just PID controllers directly to have a, as simple as possible a controller. And then we'll later look at whether um, we can um, use some of Copter's controllers instead and um, have a, you know, yeah, much more um, co um, complex and I guess um, effective um, controller. So depending on how similar the dynamics um, is and yeah. So also working on adding a civil implementation, which um, at the moment, um, CITL, um is, is working for testing of several outputs in that, but there's no dynamics added into its model. So it yeah, just moves kind of oddly or um, 
mostly season one's for. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the adding the full dynamics is still will be great for testing the autonomous function. So we're um, kind of doing that in parallel with, with the autonomy. But there, um, any questions? Uh, the, the 50 grams uh, limita limitation on payload, that's, that's yeah. the, uh, the bigger one or that's? Um, yeah, that, that's with the bigger one. So um, that's about, uh, so the balloon's about half a meter in diameter. So we're kind of getting to the point where um, we can't go too much bigger because then we won't be able to fly it down corridors or things like that. And since this is for indoor use, it's, yeah. Ah, because that's what I was going to ask next is, next is uh, why don't you go with a, like two meter or three meter? <laughs> you want to do this yeah. size, it makes sense. All right. And so I thought I'd um, finish off with a um, slight video um, just to kind of show what we've um, been working so far. So, so hopefully that's um, coming up for everyone. Um, but yeah, that gives kind of an idea. Yeah, that's coming up fine. So that's that's with the manual control, isn't it? So basically, the sticks are directly controlling the um, the amplitude on each axis. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the the sticks control um, both the amplitude and offset. So height and yaw um, add the offsets to it. And I've got a um, this stick mixing with the fin matrix happening there as well. Yep. So it might be worth, uh, even uh, Leonard and Paul and, and other sort of control people are on the call, it might be worth discussing a little bit about the, the cascaded pit architecture. Uh, so Michelle and I had a bit of a discussion about that, I think it was last week, um, and I was suggesting that the first level should be an acceleration, a, a 2D acceleration controller uh, PID, um, and then build velocity controller on top of that. Um, would that, Leonard, would that be how you'd do this? So basically... You've got to be... Oh, gentlemen. I'd be careful with uh, using acceleration feedback uh, because of the three hertz input uh -huh. and also the fact that the motion is very heavily damped. And um, that's that's exactly what I was going to say, probably less eloquently, is you've got to be very careful going too far down in the, con like, you know, to a too low a level. Um, and... and like accelerate, like trying to directly control acceleration is um, only really appropriate if you can control it very well. Um, and, and as Paul says, because this is very heavily damped, your primary, um, your primary output uh, is probably going to be um, largely proportional to the velocity you, you achieve. So trying to go to a level below that and control acceleration is, is actually going to probably make things terribly difficult for you. So you're thinking instead go first level of would be a 2D velocity controller with just a very long time constant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. just you know, set your filters appropriately. Right, okay. And your output's going to be approximately proportional to velocity, even in that case. So, um, you know, your your feed forward term in your velocity pit yeah. is actually going to be your dominant control um, parameter. Yeah. So you set your feed forward to be your output actuation magnitude um, versus your target velocity or your measured velocity. And you, you'd be able to actually initially tune your entire PIDs to zero and base it just on that feed forward right. parameter. A bit like the way we do the heli. Yeah. And, yes. and uh, if you wanted to uh, account for things like uh, air movement in buildings due, due to HVAC, um, in the periods when you're not actually moving the fins, uh, any movement relative to the air is going to produce a drag force, uh, which we talked about uh, yesterday. And I, I think the EKF with a pretty minor modification um, would be able to estimate the, the wind drift around the, around the vehicle. And mm -hmm. that would certainly help with that, working out what the feed forward needs to be in terms of the movement. 
because it's going to be very sensitive to air, air movement in the building. Well, that's going to be really the I term off. Like that's going to be your constant velocity. So that'll be that that will tend uh, to get taken up by your yeah, I term. That I term is in an inertial frame of reference, not in the body frame. Yes, very true. Yeah. But, so so you'll be able to add your velocity command to account for. Um, uh, to for for the uh, air movement as opposed to change your feed forward. Um, well, it, you're, you're, I was thinking feed forward parameter. That's the multiplication of your target airspeed, or target velocity versus the output actuator magnitude. You're talking about the actual amount of velocity you request. Well, the amount of out, output amount actuator of you request because it basically flies. this thing flies relative to air. Yeah. very much so and so you're going to have a demand in earth frame and i think we'd probably need a velocity integrator uh, an integrator in earth frame of reference um mm -hmm. in terms of accounting for the effect of uh, uh air movement in the building yeah and um this is actually one of the reasons i'll talk about it in my talk but some uh, part of the architecture changes to the position controller in copter um, was to, 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 to explicitly enable um, applications like this with the additional tuning factors to do away with a lower level acceleration loop. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay. And so that's got the integrators and the feed forwards in at the velocity level. So explicitly so to deal with aircraft like this. So what? So Randy's just mentioned uh, suggested starting with altitude control. So would the same thing apply for you? Would at the moment the copter has an acceleration controller at the lowest level in fa for vertical, yeah. right? Um, and you would go straight to velocity vertically as well and skip the acceleration stage of that loop. Well, yeah. one of the things to keep in mind about a multi rotor is the output um, actuator is force. Um, so, uh, you, that, that acceleration control, um, you know, is very useful for, uh, ex like, in, and we've got a very fast, um, feedback loop around that so, mm. to allow us to accurately get a specific acceleration vertically. Um, so that's quite useful. Um, Whereas if you don't if you don't have that, it's actually uh, often easier just to to work based on um, your uh, your velocity. The other thing is our output actuation. Whether you whether you're doing a velocity of um, five meters per second vertically or hovering, the output throttle doesn't change much, and you'll get a peak in the throttle, and then it will go back yeah. down close yeah. to Whereas with it's this. Hover. It's going to be very much a very strong relationship between throttle setting and the velocity you asymptote to. Yeah, um, right. And the okay. other interesting thing about um, having done a little bit of work with light, something lighter than air in the past was that the when you're talking about a non-streamlined shape, you end up with affected the, the uh, what's called uh, the actual effective mass of the vehicle when you start accelerating is actually higher than the calculated mass the displaced mass of the vehicle because it's pushing the it's essentially accelerating the air around it mm. so you end up when you do the calculation start analyzing the data back to try and do system id and what you think the mass is etc cetera, etc cetera, you end up scratching your head and wondering why you come out with a higher value than the uh, than the mass of the vehicle uh, the, appar the apparent mass effect. I'm very um, glad we, we asked that now because I, I was sending Michelle totally down the wrong path, which is why you shouldn't get a software engineer to make advice on controls. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Michelle, I think forget everything I told you last week and uh, listen to Leonard and Paul. Yeah, <laughs> apparent mass effect. It, it, it was uh, That was worked out theoretically back in the 1920s with, the, uh, with all the airship uh, when they had the an explosion of airship technology, um, pardon the pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were a few explosions back then. <laughs> but the, the trouble with added mass stuff is it'll change drastically depending on, if you're in a big room, it'll be approaching a sphere and open space. If you're in a corridor, it's it'll be, be hugely more. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, if you get close make to a big wall, difference. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You, you, it, it becomes higher. And that brings up another interesting point, which is, Oh, well, this is spherical, so it's not going to steer in, but there is going to be a pull-in effect as you uh, as you approach a wall, um, if you're moving. 
anyway, it's going to, it's a very interesting problem. <laughs> yes. And then capturing all of that in the, in the simulator would be a, a task in itself. So I was suggesting doing the simulator by just assuming that the fin, you, you, you capture like the position of the fin and its angular velocity and you presume it's producing a force along the, you know, the, the, where the hinge goes in and it produces a, a torque perpendicular to the surface. Uh, and then just shift that out for the position to, to calculate the total torques and, and forces and basically run that at a kilohertz or so to do the dynamics. Is that a reasonable way of capturing it just as a, if we want a very simple simulator? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, think that's a, a, I think that's a reasonable way to do it because we can make an assumption about the, the flexure of the surface, the actual working surface of the fin um, and its local movement. It, it's, it's going to be a very ad hoc sort of tuning factor to do that. Mm. I mean, having read a few, looked at a few papers with people that have modeled, uh, done modeling on in, flapping insect wings and so on, um, you, you can turn that into a PhD thesis if you want to. So we might be better off just taking some measurements <laughs> Yeah, and I was thinking maybe a table might model. be the right thing to use. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Michelle, I was diverting off onto yeah. other areas. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is fascinating. <laughs> it's a fascinating sort of vehicle. I'm I'm really uh, looking forward to seeing how we how well we do the navigation um, and getting it to fly figure eights and things in the room. And you know, it's going to be really quite fascinating to see how well this develops. Hello. A lot of parallels with a submarine um yeah. yes. and you know you, very you, much so yeah i i uh like the sub the sub code sort of pretty um wow well, it, it's it, it's uh juvenile uh <laughs> it, it, choose your words carefully there leonard <laughs> like well you know it, it, it's it's an adaption of multi-rotor like it hasn't like you know they they uh it, it that all of all of, all of the structures, like we're still trying to set up our structures to support vehicles like that and the extra this, like this is still missing however, parts to make it easy for this them. This platform has one huge advantage over the sub platform. It doesn't have a cable that people here can tie around. Uh, <laughs> <bins>. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, never let me on the sticks with these blimps, Michelle. You'll the the. The person who brought the sub to Canberra learned that I'm a very terrible pilot of submarines. I, I think it's just generally a good principle not to let Trish on the sticks. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Give him the ground station. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, there any more questions? All right. So we've got one, one final. There was a question on YouTube which said, uh, let's see, what is the pro propulsive efficiency difference between a ducted fan blimp versus the flippers? Uh, quote, I wasn't expecting to see flippers when I heard blimp. Um, yeah, that might be more for Sridhar, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, hey guys, yeah. Uh, I could just jump in. Uh, just introducing myself. I'm Shrida, um, and uh, I think Leonard. We've we've crossed paths before. From RMIT days. I don't know if you remember. Sorry, you're muted, Leonard. By the I way, do, I do. Sorry. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, as said, you know, as Michelle introduced me, you know, this is something that we were thinking about. Uh, I come from the insect flight area where they use flapping wings, um, as you know. So one of the objectives was trying to see if we can build uh, an indoor flying platform, which is going to be, you know, crash resilient like uh, insects. So the idea is now the reason we went with fins or that we wanted to explore fins was the problem with the with the prop based uh, uh, blimps that I've flown before is one is, you know, you get lots of these oscillations because the propulsive, the 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 dynamics of the propulsive system um, is an order of magnitude different from the dynamics of the of the plant. So uh, you end up with this motor doing, you know, not what it is designed to do, and uh, usually sort of burns out very quickly, or it gets very noisy. And uh, so to avoid all of those, and to you know come up with an innovative platform to get everyone a bit more interested in blimps again, so we said, hey, look, why don't we try fins? Um, and uh, it also goes down to what um, I think Leonard mentioned about um, subs. You know, the idea is, could 
could something like this uh, be a controller that we design um, on Audio Pilot uh, for blimps? Could then that be transported to a robotic fish, not even like a sub, but a robotic fish, uh, which is more, you know, which has fins and things. So it's along those lines. So there's a bit of innovation quotient going on with um, the platform itself, but also the fact that hopefully this will then, you know, uh, get more people uh, excited in the community about uh, blimps and Arduopilot and how do we add support to this uh, apparently new yeah. vehicle class. And, and propellers get tangled things. I mean, any thread or something in the water in the air, particularly underwater vehicles, they, they're always swallowing things and getting choked. Yeah, right, exactly. So um, so even for the underwater, um, you know, environment, maybe a robotic fish would be, might be a, a more suitable, um, uh, you know, uh, propulsion strategy. And uh, the idea is, you know, if this blimp or this fin-based blimp uh, method, could we then transport that or adapt that for, um, for, for fish? I do fish. I do fish, yeah, I know. Yeah, I, li I like all of these vehicles. So, so this and sub and the, any of these, uh, the the other sixed off um, uh, vehicle that uh, 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 Peter, no, sorry, um, I apologize. Somebody jump in and Pete help Hall. me. Pete Was Hall that? did the sixth off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the other hall. Um, the, uh, you know, these, uh, the, um, multi rotor, like they, they, these navigation, a lot of these things are sort of um, doing a lot of stuff with the multi rotor code, and we still, we still have to add some of these, um, the 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 translation parameters from our basic navigation code to allow these vehicles to um, easily integrate with, like if they're going to build off of multi rotor and the multi rotor navigation to actually uh, facilitate those types of, um, you know, the, the full six DOF actuated air, um, vehicles are not aircraft anymore. <laughs> They're just moving in a medium as opposed to a multi-rotor that's really just a two and a half D uh, aircraft. So yeah, I, 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 I'm really happy to see another vehicle sort of um, pushing us in that direction. Fantastic. All right, well, um, thank you, everyone. I think that's been a fascinating discussion and uh, looking forward to seeing how, how blimps develop over the, over the coming months and, uh, and years. And uh, then I'd love a fish to go in Lake Burley Griffin. I think fins on a fish uh, and getting it swimming around, you know, if we can get it done for the next Dev Conference, that'd be great. We could have the sailing boats on the surface and the fish underneath. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a challenge for somebody to, to build a, fire, a viable fish with fins. And uh, as, as Paul said, don't, don't let me on the sticks. Um, so uh, thank you all for this, it's been a, been a great session. Um, and uh, so we've now got a, a break um, and the, the next session, the fourth session of the conference starts this evening, Australian time. Um, so that would be, it's now just coming up to 2 p.m. in Canberra and it starts at 7 p.m. So five hours and 10 minutes from now. Uh, for those of you who are in a time zone where you're able to stay awake for that long, uh, you would uh, welcome you all back to the, the next session. And the first talk we have in that session is from Andy Piper entitled Good Vibrations. Uh, and following that, we have Pete Hall with his sixth off copter. Uh, so uh, that's the, you've probably all seen the, the famous video of that flying about, and he's going to be talking about the design of that and addressing some similar sort of navigation issues that, uh, that Michelle was going to have to address with blimps in the coming months. Uh, after that, we've got Tim uh, Whitehand, uh, sorry, the next morning, we've got Tim Whitehand with Transwing. We've only got two talks this evening. So I'll uh, see you all in a bit over five hours and enjoy your break. Uh, get out in the lovely sunshine if you're in Canberra and uh, look forward to talking to you all then. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Yeah. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.